Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Don Taylor. I'm a professor and labor educator at the University of Wisconsin School for Workers and a member of the Havens Rights Center Steering Committee. It's my pleasure to introduce today's visiting scholar. Uh, Tony Gilpin is a labor historian, writer, and activist who holds a PhD in American history from Yale University. Uh, she's the co-author of the book On Strike for Respect, The Clerical and Technical Workers' Strike at Yale University, 1984-85. Her writing has been published in Jacobin, Labor Notes, and In These Times, and she was the recipient of the 2018 Deborah Bernhardt Award for Labor Journalism. Her new book is titled The Long Deep Grudge, A Story of Big Capital, Radical Labor, and Class War in the American Heartland. Uh, this account of the militant, radical farm equipment workers union and its decades long battle with international harvester is the story of two competing visions of unionism, one based in labor management partnership and one based in class struggle. The, the history of FE carries important lessons for those working to revitalize the labor movement in the 21st century. As one reviewer has said, in the war of position, any union movement of the future will look to these moments to think of ways to undermine the authority of capital at the point of production and in the political economy. Another reviewer simply noted, it's amazing that the FE accomplished what it did in its short lifetime. We should celebrate its legacy and rekindle its spirit. Reading The Long Deep Grudge is a good way to start. Tony's talk today is called Class Collaboration or Class War, the Battle to Define Profit, progress, and the purpose of unionism in the 20th century labor movement. With that, I am happy to turn the microphone over to Tony Gilpin. Thanks so much, Don, and thanks to Patrick and Sarah and Pete at the Haven Rights Center for having me. This is a terrific series. I'm really um, wonderful. It's wonderful to be here, and I'm really pleased to be here in part because um, I have a PhD but I'm not a academic historian, I'm not in an institution, so I'm one of those um, independent scholars that you see referred to occasionally. And so I'm really pleased to um, be included in the, um, in the terrific grouping of um, scholars that um, are appearing here. And um, before I get into the specific talk that I'm gonna give today with that hefty title, I just wanna uh, give you a little bit of background about um, my book that and um, what it's what my talk is drawn from uh, the long deep grudge and a succinct summary of my book would be this that it's a smallish long defunct union uh, the farm equipment workers it's about this union called FE and its dealings with a company that went out of business decades ago but I found that that doesn't generally do much to pique interest so I'm going to amplify that and I'm also going to add some visuals. So let me put up some slides here. To get started. Now you're all seeing that, I hope. Everybody's got that. Um, so my book is about one of America's founding industrial empires, International Harvester, as you see up here on the screen, whose origins go back to early 19th century America and the McCormick family that controlled it. And it's the story of a uniquely radical union, the farm equipment workers or FE that arose in the 1930s to challenge this tremendously powerful company. Now, what do I mean when I call the FE radical? Well, one of the FE's top officials put it this way. The philosophy of our union was that management had no right to exist. So I'm gonna note, I'm gonna take this opportunity right here to know that one of the reasons I embarked on this study, and that's kind of a long story in itself, is that my father had once been in the FE's leadership, though he um, passed away before I started to do this work. And his story is one that's featured in my book. The long deep grudge also details how a deeply felt transformative sense of solidarity among the membership fortified the FE as the climate grew increasingly hostile for labor's left wing. 
the rank and file loved that union. That's how Frank Mingo, who was vice president of one of the FE's locals in Chicago put it, and FE members, as we'll see, registered that devotion regularly. The FE's membership was predominantly white, and yet its commitment to interracial unionism became a central pillar of the union's strength. Tomorrow I'll discuss the remarkably militant and powerful interracial local the FE built in the 1940s in Louisville, Kentucky. Today, I'm gonna to focus on another bedrock reason for this fierce loyalty from the rank and file rooted in how the FE leadership approached collective bargaining and the role the union should play in the workplace. That may sound prosaic, but what the FE leadership pursued in this regard made it the object of particular hostility from international harvesters management, as we'll see, and the left-wing FE leadership's philosophy of unionism also drew it into bitter conflict with the labor establishment, and particularly with Walter Ruther, president of America's then largest union, the United Auto Workers. The possibility of mutually beneficial, cooperatively achieved economic growth championed in the years following World War II by corporate leaders and labor statesmen like Ruther met its most vociferous challenge from the stubbornly class conscious FE leadership. At issue were two antithetical definitions of just what progress for working people would entail and how it could be secured. This argument, which at one point seems to have been conclusively decided in the UAW's favor, deserves re-examination today in light of the labor movement's precipitous late 20th century collapse and as unions still struggle to gain traction within the American working class. First though, some background on the FE and its relationship with International Harvester as that provides context for how the union's particular orientation developed. While the FE represented other farm equipment factories, International Harvester as the giant in the industry was always the most significant and the 30,000 workers from harvester plants comprised the preponderance of the union's membership. And the term class war is in the title of my book, and it's my belief that there's no better example of the deep-rooted struggle between labor and capital in American history at any rate than between this particular company and union. That's because the origins of this grudge match can be traced far back. During the massive nationwide general strike for the eight hour day that began on May 1st, 1886, police violence outside McCormick Works in Chicago prompted a demonstration a few days later in Haymarket Square. Young Cyrus McCormick II proved instrumental in ensuring that a group of anarchist labor activists were arrested and hung for the bombing that took place there that night though to this day, no one knows who was really responsible for it. In the national crackdown following what came to be called the Haymarket Riot, the eight hour day movement collapsed, unions were decimated and radical workers movements were utterly destroyed. Indeed, the title of my book is a reference to the legacy of Haymarket as the Chicago author Nelson Algren wrote in 1951 of the dark grudge cast by the four standing at the gallows head for the hope of the eight hour day and of the long deep grudge born for McCormick, the reaper. The McCormick name was and still is ubiquitous in Chicago and by the early 20th century, their business had morphed into the International Harvester Corporation. Since IH as it's sometimes called has been out of business for some time, I should emphasize that it was once the fourth largest corporation in the world. And through much of the 20th century, it was the behemoth of the farm equipment industry, employing hundreds of thousands in factories, mines, and mills across the globe. The heart of the McCormick's far-flung enterprise remained in the Midwest, including the mammoth McCormick and Tractor Works complex located on Chicago's near west side. When the Great Depression hit, and a new upsurge in organizing, the industrial unionism of the Congress of Industrial Organizations or CIO 
challenged America's corporate giants, it's a notable but little known fact that International Harvester held out longest against that tide. By this point, Harvester had moved beyond simple repression to embrace more sophisticated forms of union avoidance and pioneered many techniques that have become standard business practice today. One can see echoes of Harvester's manipulative managerial machinations in the tactics utilized today by Amazon to forestall the organizing drive in Alabama. In the 1920s, Harvester became a leader in what was dubbed welfare capitalism, introducing a host of programs that were designed as much to control as they were to reward their employees. Harvester also created one of the first corporate industrial relations departments, and as part of that, had introduced company unions to all of its plants way back in 1919. Coal miner and CIO founder John L. Lewis called organizing International Harvester the hardest job I know of, and he knew a bit about taking on tough opponents. Though the FE gained recognition at Tractor Works in 1938, it took until mid-1941. So after U.S. Steel, Republic Steel, General Motors, General Electric, and even the notoriously anti-union Ford Motor Company, for Fowler McCormick, grandson of both Cyrus McCormick I and John D. Rockefeller, to sign a multi-plant contract with the CIO union, the FE. And as I emphasize in my book, the FE's example makes clear that the CIO upsurge of the 1930s was not entirely as spontaneous as is often represented. The union breakthrough at Harvester was the culmination of a slow but steady organizing campaign stretching decades back. And the key organizers involved in the drive to introduce genuine industrial democracy within International Harvester were members of or sympathetic to the Communist Party. Joe Weber, who became involved in the unionization drive at Harvester in the early 1930s, was central to that effort. Weber was born in Yugoslavia, but his family came to Chicago when he was a boy, moving to the neighborhood near McCormick Works. I grew up in the tradition of Haymarket, Weber said. He trained as a machinist, but while in his early 20s, discovered his true calling, organizing for the Communist Party. And in fact, he spent a good portion of 1929 in Moscow at the International Lenin School, studying Marxism in theory and practice. When back in the US, Weber hit the road and frequently rough, rode into rough territory for radical activists, spreading the union gospel among coal miners in Harlan County, Kentucky, for instance, where he almost lost his life when he was savagely beaten on a backcountry road by sheriff's deputies. Weber was a veritable organizing juggernaut. And after the formation of the CIO in 1935, John L. Lewis tapped him to direct the union drive at Harvester, but also to serve as one of the principal leaders of the steel workers organizing committee, then taking on the little steel companies on Chicago's South Side. On Memorial Day in 1937, Weber addressed an assemblage of striking steel workers, families and supporters Shortly thereafter, Chicago police officers, intent on doing serious damage, careened into the crowd. 10 workers were killed by the police, all shot from behind or in the side as they vainly tried to flee. In keeping with the way these things usually work, the press held the union responsible for the tragedy. Weber was arrested and interrogated for several days, though he was ultimately released his troubles weren't over. Following the passage of the Smith Act in 1940, which allowed for the deportation of non-citizens who engaged in subversive activity, the FBI and immigration authorities stepped up the harassment of Weber. He ultimately served time in prison, but was allowed to stay in the country, though he was obliged to retreat from union activities. But others Weber had tutored and who shared his Communist Party orientation by the late 1930s stepped into leadership positions in the FE. Grant Oaks and Jerry Field, workers from Harvester's Tractor and McCormick Works, 
and Milt Burns and DeWitt Gilpin, who'd been organizers and writers, became top officials of the union. African Americans like A.J. Martin out of the giant Peoria Caterpillar tractor plant, who became an FE vice president in 1946, and Pope Huff from McCormick Works, who served on the FE's executive board, were also connected to the Communist Party. Many key local FE leaders as well had ties to the party. So it was at the least ironic that titanic international harvester with its venerable tradition of opposition to organized labor would end up obliged to deal with a union whose leaders do, drew frequent and publicly acknowledged inspiration from the anarchist Haymarket martyrs. Worker-run factories may have been the distant vision for communist-inspired FE officials, but on a daily basis, this translated to confrontation rather than cooperation with harvester management from the bargaining table on down to the shop floor. As the Cold War era dawned, this ideology would set the FE on a collision course with the mainstream non-communist labor establishment. The UAW's Walter Ruther was the most forceful and eloquent of the coterie of labor statesmen who would assert control over the CIO. By the late 1920s, Ruther had emerged as an early advocate for auto unionism in Detroit. And in his youth, he flirted with varying forms of socialism. Like Joe Weber, Ruther even spent time in Moscow in 1933, working at an auto factory there. But by World War II, Ruther's political proclivities have shifted right. And by the time he became in 1946, president of the UAW, by then the country's biggest union, he vowed to purge all communist adherents from the UAW. His combination of intellectual heft, faith in a New Deal style regulatory welfare state, and ardent anti-communism allowed Ruther to win the admiration of liberal leaders and secured for the UAW an increasingly important role within the Democratic Party in the Cold War era. But Ruther's rising prominence spelled trouble for the FE's leadership. From the beginning, there had been some tension between the two unions springing from obvious jurisdictional overlap. International Harvester, for instance, made trucks as well as farm equipment. And so early on, the UAW had organized some harvester truck plants. That issue might have been resolved easily enough had it not been for the increasingly wide political fault line developing between the two unions. Once Walter Ruther consolidated his hold over the UAW, he issued a direct challenge to the FE by asserting complete jurisdiction over the farm equipment industry, setting out to organize, in other words, workers at the, like those at International Harvester who had already been organized by the FE. This contest for the hearts and minds of harvester workers then made manifest the contrasting visions of unionism embraced by the FE and UAW leaderships. Let's take a look first at the UAW's approach. Walter Ruther, just as was the case for the FE leadership and other left-wing union activists, abhorred the inequality generated by unfettered capitalism. He parted company with Marxist analysis, however, in his assessment of how exploitation occurs and what can be done to address it. Ruther, as historian Kevin Boyle noted, remained convinced that under the rule of law, competing classes could work for the common good and defined the fundamental di division in American society as between private privilege and the people rather than that between capital and labor. I have nothing against free enterprise, Ruther insisted. Thus in 1947, Ruther, along with Harvester President Fowler McCormick, endorsed a code of economic group behavior which encouraged union leaders to promote employee practices which will increase productivity and improve the competitive position of the company and that they undertake informing union members of the responsibilities the employer is facing. Ruther, in short, championed what's been called the politics of productivity, 
which held that an efficiently organized economy with cooperating, cooperatively achieved ever increasing production levels promised progress for everyone, management, workers, and consumers alike. The 1950 UAW General Motors Treaty of Detroit, so dubbed by Fortune magazine, was the most famous exemplar of this philosophy, a five-year contract introducing cost of living and productivity pay increases, in other words, rewards for increased output, along with good wages and benefits for General Motors workers, but which also obliged the union to partner with management to ensure efficient and uninterrupted product production. In other words, how work was to be done and how fast it would be accomplished was deemed an exclusively managerial prerogative. Thus, the contract also limited the union's ability to respond immediately to discontent over working conditions. The agreement provided for a relatively small number of stewards and committeemen, those union representatives who are the first responders, so to speak, when workers have disputes with management on the job. It also included a stiff no strike clause, which required union officials to condemn and curtail any walkouts that took place while the contract was in effect. We don't go for wildcatting the year round, Walter Ruther said, insisting that UAW members valued long periods of stability as much as corporate executives did. The Treaty of Detroit was wild, widely heralded in the business press for injecting good common sense into labor relations. It is the first major union contract, said the editors of Fortune, that explicitly accepts objective economic facts, cost of living and productivity as determining wages, thus throwing overboard all theories of wages as determined by political power and of profit as surplus value. The UAW's acceptance of these objective economic facts and the promise of uninterrupted production was worth far more than the many millions in wages and benefits GM would pay for it. As far as Fortune magazine was concerned, GM got a bargain. The class conscious FE leadership, however, stubbornly maintained the Marxist belief that workers' wages were reflective of relative power and not of objective economic facts, and that profits were derived from the inherently exploitative appropriation of surplus value. FE leaders thus broadly castigated the Treaty of Detroit and also refused to sign on to the code of economic group behavior that both Walter Ruther and Fowler McCormick had backed. A cooperative framework, so the FE leadership insisted, belies the fact that there is only one side for business, its side, and that it operates on the principle of getting as much as it can. It can be deterred in its exploitation only by applying economic and political pressure 365 days a year. What did this mean in practice? It meant that FE leaders pursued collective bargaining objectives that were the polar opposite of those contained in the Treaty of Detroit and that constituted an entirely different notion of how progress for working people would be achieved. These stands were grounded in the belief that what mattered for workers was not just how much money they might take home, but also how much control they exercised over their lives on the job. FE leaders therefore opposed long contracts, preferring one year agreements and the agitation attendant to more frequent negotiations. We believed in keeping things in turmoil, one FE staff member said, because we used every opportunity to arouse workers. They opposed cost of living and productivity pay increases, believing that such contract language encouraged speed ups and limited what workers were entitled to. They resisted no strike clauses and embraced a large and relatively unfettered steward body. If you've ever worked in an international harvester factory, but given that they, the last one closed decades ago, I'm willing to bet that you probably have not out there. 
then you might understand just how consequential the FE's positions were. At Harvester, most production employees were peace workers, meaning they didn't receive a simple and company-wide per hour wage, but rather each individual worker's pay was determined by an incentive system so mind-bogglingly complex that even economists at the Department of Labor proclaimed they couldn't make sense of it. At Harvester, every part of every piece of farm equipment and each effort re required to produce it had its own pay rate attached to it. By the 1940s, in Tractor Works alone, there were some 30,000 different piecework rates that might be in effect at any given moment. Thus, two workers laboring side by side in the same plant, performing essentially the same job at International Harvester, might receive very different paychecks at the end of the week. Its incentive pay system, Harvester insisted, was engineered to achieve maximum efficiency and productivity. Piecework rates were calculated utilizing scientific methods and were therefore intrinsically correct. To Harvester workers, however, they seem based on little beyond what the company could get away with. Management's continual efforts to retime jobs and recalibrate, recalibrate pay rates in the company's favor contributed to this belief. Going all the way back to the 19th century, peace were complaints, meaning objections to management's efforts to get employees to work harder and faster for the same or less money were the single greatest source of discontent among harvester employees. The Marxist FE leadership recognized this as a system fine-tuned to eke out as much surplus value from each and every worker as possible. Harvester employees so declared an FE newsletter in 1942 know that the harder they work and the more they produce, the time study men work just as hard robbing them of their honest earnings. And so chiseling time studies must be stopped, the newsletter declared. The left-wing FE leadership subscribing as they did to the politics of class conflict rather than the politics of productivity, thus wanted no part of any cooperative effort to enhance efficiency, or as they put it, to facilitate speed up and exploitation. But among the IH workforce, there was little enthusiasm for the tenants of the Treaty of Detroit either. Harvester workers especially valued those aspects of the FE contract that stood in contradistinction to the UAW's more cooperative framework. Though the FE's contract with International Harvester contained a no-strike clause, as did all union agreements, it put far less onus on the union than the Treaty of Detroit did. The FE had fought for and maintained a large and remarkably unfettered steward body. Stewards were empowered to leave their jobs on the company's dime to handle workers' grievances whenever they saw fit. This provision allowed FE stewards, as Harvester Management put it, to freely roam the plants, to promote unrest, stir up ill will, harass the company, and convince as many members as it can that labor relations is and must be class warfare. It was certainly true that the FE leadership assumed no commitment to help ensure uninterrupted production, and therefore stewards were encouraged to address workers' grievances immediately. In practice, this meant that when a harvester worker felt cheated on a piecework price, when work was speeded up in a department, or when an employee was ordered to perform an unsafe operation, an FE steward was likely to respond not by filing a report, but by immediately calling union members off their jobs. The figures tell this remarkable tale. In the nine year period from 1946 to 1954, at the dozen or so international harvester plants represented by the FE, there were over 1,000 work stoppages. That's an astronomical figure representing walkout rates during the period that far surpassed those at plants represented by the UAW, 
either those truck facilities within International Harvester or at auto factories, for instance. And just to put things in a contemporary context, in our most recent nine year period from 2012 to 2020, last year, among the 160 million workers in the United States, we had only 131 strikes in total during that entire period. The 30,000 FE members at IH plants were stopping work at least that many times every year. And sometimes as in 1950, when they walked out 177 times, much more often. Such conduct made harvester officials apoplectic and their antipathy toward the FE was frequently and publicly expressed. The company wants good relations with responsible unions, Harvester Management insisted in a 1947 letter sent to all its employees that was widely quoted in the business press. But the FE's leadership, so Harvester declared, are irresponsible radicals who are more interested in disruption than in labor management peace. Privately, FE leaders may not have disagreed with that assessment. But as far as they were concerned, there was a practical reason for all this disruption. Through it, workers got what they deserved and promptly. As one FE steward put it, if something happened to a worker today and we walk out, his case will be settled in the morning. Every walkout, every time we walked out, it got results. Such immediacy benefited harvester workers, not just by affording them better compensation, but also by ensuring them more livable working conditions. And this distinction between the FE and the UAW on such matters was duly noted by rank and file workers. A 1947 issue of the FE local newspaper in Louisville noted that the UAW's contract with Ford allowed workers to be fired if they could not or would not work at the speed the company demanded. But nowhere in the harvester contract, the paper continued, is there a clause which allows the company to fire a man because it is impossible to keep up with speed up or because he engages in an effort to bring the speed up under control. FE would never sign such a clause in any contract. And another FE member took a dim view of Walter Ruther's condemnation of wildcat strikes. The UAW will tell you there won't be any walkouts, he said. That's true. The company will cut your wages, knock out your seniority and your vacations, and there will be no way you can protest outside of quitting your job. There will be nothing left at the plant but wage cuts and speed up. The FE's direct challenge to managerial control and to the maximization of corporate profit taking and the leadership's refusal to accept, as a, to accept as objective facts, those precepts which granted capitalists hegemonic control over the economy, it was this radical approach to trade union practice, as much if not more so than the left-wing political positions enunciated in the union's newspaper that made the FE and the other communist influenced unions a threat to the Cold War order. The 1947 Taft-Hartley Act aimed to weaken the labor movement generally, but the provision requiring union officials to sign affidavits affirming they were not communist party members was a dagger aimed directly at the left. In 1949, the labor establishment moved to cast out those unions deemed to be communist dominated. And the FE, along with a dozen or so other unions representing over a million workers were expelled from the CIO. At this time, the FE entered into an autonomous affiliation with the United Electrical Workers, then the third largest industrial union and also one of the left-wing unions expelled from the CIO. FE leaders, local and national, were roundly and routinely condemned as Reds in the mainstream, mainstream press, harassed by the FBI, and hauled before government investigatory committees. All this naturally encouraged Walter Ruther in his drive to extinguish the FE, 
And the much bigger and better financed UAW stepped up its raiding campaign, triggering NLRB elections at plants where the FE was already the recognized bargaining agent. In its efforts to entice harvester workers, the UAW dispatched scores of organizers and invested heavily in literature and advertising. Red baiting attacks on the FE leadership were central to the UAW's message, but so too was its guarantee of more Pacific labor management relations. All that money spent and effort expended fell flat. At harvester plants in Chicago, in Louisville, and at others throughout the Midwest, the UAW tried dozens of times, sometimes more than once at the same plant, to lure harvester workers from the FE. Yet the FE outstaffed, outfinanced, and outcast from the mainstream labor movement, each time emerged victorious, often by impressive margins. Clearly, for those workers in the American heartland, the taint of communism was not as damning as might have been presumed, nor was the promise of greater shop floor stability much of a temptation. But despite this dogged loyalty from harvester workers for the FE, or more correctly, because of it, the pressures on the union from all fronts continued to mount. The battle with International Harvester reached a crescendo in 1952, a year of high drama for the FE. In July, International Harvester announced that it would move its twine mill, a facility that stood next to McCormick Works in Chicago, south to New Orleans. For years, we have heard International Harvester and the millionaire McCormick's boast of their responsibility to employees and the public, one FE flyer read. The truth is that Harvester's planning all too clearly includes relocation of as many plants as possible to low wage sweatshop, non-union Jim Crow areas. But the FE did more than issue paper protests as African-American Robert Ray, the president of the FE local at the Twine Mill announced, we will put up a physical fight to keep the machinery from being moved. And 250 workers, many were black, some of Eastern European descent and many of them women promptly engaged in a sit down strike. A little over a day after the occupation began, the Chicago Police Department charged in to clear the workers out and outside the plant, a full scale melee developed as FE members attempted to blockade trucks bound for New Orleans loaded up with the plant's machinery. But that was merely a dress rehearsal for what came next as in August, 1952, the FE went on strike against International Harvester IH kept its plants open during the walkout and made clear its intentions to get rid of the FE once and for all. And given how FE members generally responded, as these shown here in East Moline, Illinois, for example, to those who tried to cross their picket lines, it was no surprise that the strike quickly became violent. Now, I'm not gonna tell you more about what happened since this dramatic strike, which also involved a sensational murder trial, is really worth reading about in the detail I provide in my book. And I have to leave you know, some things unsaid to encourage you to actually read the whole thing. But it's, it's probably obvious to all of you that all did not end well for the FE since the union itself no longer exists. But there's much that's worth gleaning from the FE's story, especially for those interested in reviving the labor movement. With so much of the labor movement moribund today, it's appealing to look back to union militancy in previous periods, particularly the Great Depression for inspiration. And the FE can provide a case in point. But it's become a bit of a truism that after World War II, Rank and file based militancy was quickly stifled by an increasingly bureaucratic, cooperatively minded labor leadership that bought in to the politics of productivity. 
The FE's example, however, makes it quite clear that militant thought and conduct continued within some unions through the 1940s and into the 1950s. At least Fortune Magazine thought so, as in this late 1946 article, they referred to the FE's president as party lining, class warring Grant Oaks, shown speaking on May Day at the grave of the Haymarket martyrs. So let's recognize that one need not look too far back or to other countries to find alternative visions of a labor movement animated by a belief in class warfare rather than class collaboration. And that perspective had implications beyond a greater propensity to walk off the job. This was not simply a display of contrariness. All those walkouts at FE plants were grounded in the radical leadership's insistence that they had a duty not to bolster, but to claw back as much corporate wealth as possible. And so they resisted schemes that linked compensation to productivity and that sought, and sought to directly undermine in a myriad of ways management's ceaseless drive for greater efficiency on the shop floor. That allowed the union to challenge management's presumption of the unilateral right to determine how work would be done and to put into its action and to put into action its principle that every grievance represented a scream for justice that deserved an immediate response. FE members, as the union continually emphasized, were entitled to good wages and should not have to press themselves to exhaustion to get them. Today, when so many workers labor in hazardous environments, performing tasks at a punishing pace, their schedules irregular and with little control over their time, whether we're talking about Amazon warehouses, meat packing plants, or nursing homes, the offer of FE style urgent and combative union representation might be just the ticket for organizing the unorganized. By now, at the least, workers advocates should recognize that when management tries to peddle schemes based on productivity, efficiency, or objective economic facts, they're being sold a bill of goods. The FE leadership's Marxist mindset also allowed the union to mount an aggressive challenge as in the 1952 Twine Mill sit down to the notion that companies had the right to move their facilities wherever they might make easier money. The labor establishment, however, having hitched its wagon to the belief that higher corporate profits would ensure greater prosperity for all was left slack jawed as jobs were shipped overseas and companies squeezed more and more production out of fewer people, making a wasteland of so many working class communities and further brutalizing the on the job experiences for those lucky enough to remain employed. In sum then, the ideological orientation of a union leadership and not just tough talk matters and has both short term and long-term consequences. And one principle I'd argue that a militant 21st century labor movement must, must by now recognize is that progress cannot be a collaborative class project. For working people to get more, capitalists must get less. So I hope you'll join me tomorrow when I'm gonna talk about another critical way by building interracial solidarity through which the FE engendered such fierce loyalty within the International Harvester Workshop workforce and how the FE leadership viewed rank and file militancy as integral to the battle against racism. Okie doke, I'm gonna stop this screen share now. All right. Thank you so much, Tony. That was such a, a stimulating talk and I really loved those vivid visuals. So I'm sure that's bound to generate a really rich discussion. Um, and just to say, I think Haymarket is having another one of their famous sales for those <laughs> who are interested in, in buying Tony's wonderful book. Um, so we have until about 2 p.m. Central Time for questions and comments. And 
Uh, not to put you on the spot, Tony, but I think we're fortunate to have somebody who can don both an activist hat and an intellectual hat. So uh, hopefully people can, can take advantage of, of our time with you today. So um, you're welcome to either activate your camera and microphone to ask a question directly, or you can submit a question through the chat, uh, which I'll read aloud just as a reminder. So to ask a question directly, you can move your cursor to the reactions tab in the Zoom menu at the bottom of your screen and then select raise hand and we'll then enable you to turn on your microphone. So it, it looks like uh, James Barrett has a, a question in the chat and, and James, if you'd like to um, raise your hand and, and ask that live, you're welcome to do so. Um, otherwise, oh, fabulous, okay. So here, uh, let me enable you. Okay, terrific. Hi, Jim. I think you can Hi. talk. <laughs> Hi. Um, so a number of these uh, left-wing unions um, took strong civil rights positions. Um, United Packing House workers uh, was kind of famous for this and the food and tobacco workers, uh, especially in the South. Um, and one thing that I was never clear on, and it sounds like the FE might be a good place to look at it, is uh, membership support for all that. So the food and tobacco workers, for example, um, at least in North Carolina, uh, had a very large black membership. Um, and in the case of the FE, if I understood you correctly, um, at least in a number of the plants, uh, whites are in a large majority. Uh, and there may also have been some differences in terms of membership support for an aggressive civil rights program from one location to another. But I, I wondered if you could talk a little bit in general about um, support for the FE's um, aggressive position on civil rights, um, you know, among black workers, but I would especially be interested in anything you had to say about broader support. In other words, white workers' attitudes towards all this. Um, thank you, Jim. I think probably many of you on the call may know Jim Barrett as um, one of the best labor historians in the country and whose work on the packing house workers and workers in Chicago generally is um, something that I uh, admire greatly and have drawn from and Jim is a great friend. So, um, so he knows probably as much about this question in other unions as I can speak to it in terms of the FE. And also Jim, I'm gonna say you are stealing or forcing me to speak to the talk I'm going to give tomorrow, <laughs> which is specifically about um, the FE's interracial um, model of unionism and how, you know, and, and how um, extraordinary, as you know, this, this, this was within the FE because they were a majority white union. Their, their, their membership was always about 80% white because most farm equipment factories were located in um, in more rural parts of uh, the country. So the International Harvester had plants in Chicago, but it also had plants um, scattered throughout the Midwest. So its membership was largely white and yet the union, and again, this is based on its um, communist party oriented leadership pursued um, this aggressive program of interracial unionism. And I really don't wanna give too much away except to say that, so come back tomorrow, except that that it, it really was this um, extraordinary juggling act. And in Louisville, for example, which is what I go into in detail, you had a majority white workforce with um, African-Americans being moved into a plant um, where blacks did not have access to those kinds of jobs. International Harvester actually had relatively progressive hiring 
practices. So the union's organizing drive, which was insistent on um, non-discriminatory unionism and supported um, this, this aggressive model of interracial activism, it's, it's extraordinary that they managed to win in Louisville. It's then extraordinary that they managed to build this extraordinarily strong local. And I will say that two of the other things that distinguished the FE, aside from the, the stands you might see in the union's newspaper um, about um, uh, commitment to civil rights, were that the union pursued in contract terms things that were also advantageous to African-Americans. So for example, plant-wide seniority. And from its organizing drive in the, in the late 1930s, um, advocating for workers in international harvester to move into machine shops and more skilled jobs. Um, and then also that they had black leadership at all levels of the union from early on, including by 1946, two members, a vice president and a, a member of its executive board who were African-American. That was on, heard of in um, unions at the time. So, so how they managed to do this is actually a pretty um, extraordinary thing. I think it was just a, um, a question of uh, aggressive nonstop advocacy about why, how solidarity has to work. Um, one of the people on this call who um, is also, I hope, going to be tuning in tomorrow I see your name, but out of phrase because people's most, mostly cameras are turned off is Beverly Watkins, who is the daughter. There you are, Beverly. She's the daughter of Sterling Neal, who is one of the FE's key leaders in, um, in Louisville. And her family is an important and um, prominent family in Louisville in the African-American community. Her brother, Gerald, was the first African-American elected to Kentucky State Senate. So, um, Sterling Neal was one of those people who was um, at the forefront of figuring out how to bring to white workers a message of interracial solidarity that they embraced. And I think it's a, it, was, it was a pretty extraordinary story. So come back tomorrow, everybody who wants to hear about that. And I would love to hear if maybe Beverly has something to throw in here, or if you want to wait till tomorrow, I don't want to put you on the spot, Beverly. Tomorrow, okay. Well, I, tomorrow I'll have her speak. Is that good enough, Jim? I don't know. I probably haven't answered your question very well. It's pretty good. Uh, I, I'm from Chicago, and uh, the prospects for uh, interracial uh, labor solidarity are sometimes seem dim. Uh, and I was especially interested in the case of a union that had a very large white membership. Yeah. It seems to suggest some level of support for those policies among white workers, but there's also a possibility that white workers supported that union for other reasons, not necessarily because they supported, you know, an aggressive position uh, with regard to race relations and civil rights, but I'll, I'll stop. Yeah, well, and I think, I think that's possible. And one of the things that maybe I think is um, uh, perhaps a criticism that could be raised in my book is that it's, it, it makes it sound too easy, <laughs> that struggle, because I think it was, an, it was a, an ongoing struggle. You always had factionalism within the unions. You always had people who were pushing back against certainly that commitment to um, interracial solidarity. I think it was as, just as difficult, if not maybe more so in Chicago, as it was in Louisville, the advantage the organizers had in Louisville was that they were coming in to a new plant that didn't have longstanding traditions of seniority or groups of workers who had already kind of established themselves. And so um, to some extent, they had a little bit of an advantage in that regard in Louisville. So, you know, and it's, I mean, you know, anybody that's from Chicago knows that race relations are as troubled and um, difficult here as they may be anywhere else. So I think, you know, there were times when, um, yeah, so how, how exactly they did that, I have to say, continues to be not something I entirely know all the secrets. Um, but all I know is they were committed to it and raised positions within the membership from a very early standpoint that you might have said, were may would have made them doomed to failure um and yet they they it didn't so but come back tomorrow so we can discuss this in in greater um in greater detail let me turn it back to sarah in terms of what i should do next 
Great. Yeah. And I'm so glad you could provide a little teaser to encourage people to come back tomorrow. So uh, Paul from University of Auckland asks, uh, can you comment on FE's internal governance structures and processes on the nature of its union democracy? Yes, that's a great question and one that I, I'm not, um, one that I didn't really address terribly much in my book. Um, I don't really talk about the, the union's um, constitution or its structure. Um, they were, it was very much a, a membership-based and meeting-based union. So I can tell you this, they had meetings all the time, membership meetings all the time. In Louisville, again, like the, the, the Louisville Courier Journal, which was not a big fan of necessarily of this radical union, but acknowledged that the union was probably as democratic as any union in the United States in terms of having um, membership meetings all the time and airing its problems um, to the membership. But alas, I can't really speak that much to how the union's um, uh, constitution and governance compared to other unions, because I haven't really, to be honest, um, looked at that too much. So that's not a very, great answer to your question. Um, but I do have a, um, a lovely graphic, which I didn't include about the FE's commitment to, to rank and file unionism and the notion that, um, you know, that, that, that governance um, should be centered in the rank and file. And obviously the, the discussion I gave about the importance of stewards who are always elevated as kind of the most important officials sort of within the union and that kind of shop floor activism was in itself obviously a form of, of democracy that the FE was um, continually practicing. So um, I believe in that sense too, we can talk about the difference between a bureaucratic union and a shop floor activism oriented kind of model that the FE promoted, which drew workers into daily activism um, in a way that I think was really critical. Great. And there's another question in the chat from Jenna Lloyd. Um, I was intrigued to learn about Effie's analysis of plant relocation to the Jim Crow South. Could you say more about that and Ruther's analysis? Right. And again, um, and it's a good thing I, I divided this into two talks. I mean, the, the, the International Harvester's decision to start moving its plant south is also something I'm going to talk about tomorrow because it was part of that post-World War II wave of capital that begins to move to the South in the same way that, of course, a few decades later, we saw companies start to move entirely out of the country um, into to offshore. So the initial move for all of these companies was to find locations in the South that were, as the description said, um, low wage, non-union, the Jim Crow South. So Louisville, you know, was a was a segregated town. The wage rates were much lower. And so again, come back tomorrow because the FE's big battle after it organizes that plant is actually to challenge the lower wage rates that International Harvester plans to introduce in its um, new Louisville plant in 1946. So, um, so taking on that directly is part of what um, the FE's um, movement, the FE's challenge in Louisville um, was about. And so again, I don't wanna give too much away or read the book because it's obviously all in the book, but, um, but yeah, that's um, sort of figuring out how to confront capital flight is something that I also think is part of this um, divide between uh, the UAW style, more collaborative framework and the FE's class conscious one, you, you're really not left with an answer if your model is to augment corporate productivity, efficiency, and profit taking. Once corporations move to the point, which they obviously will, that it's even more efficient and better for us to move out of the country entirely where workers can be had even cheaper there's really nothing that the union has in its arsenal to respond with. And that's, so that was the problem in, 19, in the 1950s, 60s, even into the 70s, the UAW's model of exchanging, of trading those management prerogatives, allowing management to make all those important decisions about the way in which work was done, how it was done, how fast it was done, how many workers it would take to, um, to build a piece of farm equipment or a car or a computer um, were all left to management 
to make those decisions. And the trade-off was that we'd get great wages and benefits in exchange. So that worked and pensions, and that worked pretty well for auto workers, for example, through the 60s and 70s. But as more and more companies made that decision to move out of the country entirely, that's when that bargain started to, um, the real cost of that bargain started to become clearer and clearer um, for those auto workers as they saw their plants being shut down and as they saw the, the possibility for their own um, children having that kind of um, future ahead of them where at least they could get a decent wage and, and a pension and have health insurance and all those things which they can't, which, you know, which are incredibly difficult to find these days. Wonderful. So uh, Patrick Barrett is actually going to ask a question and then we have it in the chat. Uh, thanks. Uh, Tony, as you know, and I just let everybody else know, I think that the book is absolutely fabulous. And I'm not saying that just by way of, you know, propaganda. It's really, truly fantastic book. One of the best I've read in a long, long time. Um, so I, I, my question has to do with the fact that I grew up in West Allis, Wisconsin, which was the site of Alice Chalmers, also a big producer of farm equipment. And, um, you know, there was, of course, a, a well-known strike that took place there in 1941. And I, if I remember correctly, that was a UAW local, right. um, communist-led. And I'm just curious to know what, because there's no mention of either that strike or the, the union or the, the firm in the book, although I believe you cite the book that um, that was written about that strike. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm just curious to what degree there were, there was any communication between FE and the folks in West Allis. Um, and, you know, what, what lessons you might derive from the experience of being a UAW local under Ruther's leadership. Um, and just whatever cross pollinization might have been going on and um, lessons learned. Uh, and what you know you learned per perhaps from contrasting the two cases. Right, there there certainly was um, communication and support, mutual support between the, that um, Alice Ch radically led Alice Chalmers local up in Wisconsin and um, FE leadership, uh, as there were sort of tentacles and support and outreach between all you know the increasing shrinking. Um, left-wing current of unionism in um, in the U.S. So um, so yeah, um, I don't you know I specifically focused on international harvester in my book just because of this the the, the you know the the um, position of of harvester as the the um, overwhelming leader in the industry for much of the period I talk about and also just because of its long history and sort of and and its importance for the FE. But obviously there were other uh, important farm equipment manufacturers, Caterpillar, John Deere, Alice Chalmers, that were organized at least in part by the FE, but you did have this, you know, jurisdictional problem sort of stretching back even um, with that Alice Chalmers local when the UAW had organized um, some of the plants under uh, all of these various companies. Um, just because in, in the early years of the CIO, kind of everybody was organizing wherever they could. So the UAW had organized a number of, of plants before it's kind of political, um, uh, before the, the anti-communism of the Ruther faction had solidified. So if Ruther hadn't taken over the UAW and hadn't been as determined as he was to kind of rid his union of its um, communist elements, you might have had things develop differently within the CIO and between those, those unions. So, you know, there's a whole, big history of that kind of factional fighting and of the infighting between the FE and the UAW and the maneuvering to try to, within the FE, to try to kind of bolster the not, the, 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 the not anti-communist factions within the UAW. And so, you know, which I decided it was, it's very complicated and a lot of um, uh, sort of, um, you know, internist and warfare that I decided not to include in the book, but, you know, I think part of what happens with the left, you have these, you know, the, the unions that were expelled in 1949, which included the United Electrical Workers and the Longshore Workers out on the West Coast. Those are the only two unions that survived the expulsion that still exist today. In other words, um, you had another other 
dozen unions, all of which were, um, you know, had some form of the kind of orientation uh, in terms of their approach to collective bargaining and organizing that I um, enunciated that the FE had. And, you know, as the Cold War becomes increasingly um, uh, in heats up and as the forces arrayed against these unions become increasingly powerful, you know, one of the things that happens is it fractures even the ability of those unions to support each other, to work with each other, to, you know, their leaders are getting arrested or their leaders are getting deported or, you know, I mean, Harry Bridges, for example, the ILWU leader has a long fight against his own deportation. So, you know, all these things are just so tremendously draining that, and, you know, there's no internet, there was no, <laughs> there's no way to communicate, you know, so I think one of the things that also weakens the left is their inability to support each other as they kind of have to circle the wagons and um, focus on their own membership and their own, you know, the FE fought, fought, fighting off all these raids from the UAW was tremendously draining. They kept winning, but nonetheless, they had to expend a lot of resources on um, fending off the UAW. So, um, so yeah, so, so definitely though, there was communication between um, Christoffel at, in the Alice Chalmers local. I think there's someone, John Melrod, I think is on this call somewhere who is a an, an, an auto worker from Wisconsin who has some of this, knows some of this backstory um, from his long history in the UAW. Yes, go ahead, John. If you wanted to say anything, John, that would be nice. You're it, muted. It's though. interesting because I, I worked actually in West Dallas when I was uh, discharged from the American Motors Com Corporation. And the effect of Christoffel and the Alice Chalmers strike had left a history. I worked at Press Steel Tank. And during that Alice Chalmers strike, all of the factories in West Dallas walked out in a small general strike to support the Alice Chalmers strike. And that those things alone create a sort of militancy that lasts through the years. It's like a taste, <clears throat> it's like a taste of something that's in your mouth that continues to linger. But more specifically, in response to the question about was it the FE that sort of propagated this theory of militant combat unionism? <clears throat> At American Motors, people probably don't even remember it, but we made the Matador and the Ambassador. It was the Rambler plant, the Nash plant, then American Motors. But we, when I went to work in 72, just two years before, at the two American Motors plants, the one in Kenosha and then the one in Milwaukee, there had been 12 Wildcat strikes in a week. So that tradition, we were an outlier, but it still existed. When I got there in 72, we had one steward for every 35 workers, the right to strike over all grievances and 100% voluntary overtime, which led to a very militant workforce. There were enough stewards that we had three or 400 stewards who were paid by the company who didn't have to work <clears throat> more than a half hour a day if they chose not to. And we just roamed the plant, caught, <laughs> exactly as you say, causing class conflict. Um, it wasn't until 85 that they finally were able to force those concessions on us, which was primarily because Ray No had partnered with American Motors and had the ability to, rem <clears throat> to remove the models that we were working on to France. And that was the final cudgel that beat us down was to keep the plant alive and to keep, <clears throat> to keep those two models in the plant and to provide for retirement of 18,000 people and transfer rights, et cetera. We gave up the steward ratio, the right to strike and the, um, in the voluntary overtime, but that was till 1985. Yeah, yeah, and if I can just you know follow up on what John said, I mean, one two two points that I think are important. I mean, if you can imagine, for example, probably many of you have been reading the stories about the Amazon organizing drive in Alabama and the conditions that Amazon workers um, endure in those warehouses. The, the you know the endless work and the speed up and the difficulties and the physical challenges that they're that they undergo. So imagine though if they had 
union stewards who could who are just kind of coming around and saying, hey, how, how are you doing? You know, is are you working too fast? You know, are you you know, did, did you get your break? Did you you know, did you get your your hour lunch? You know, is that is that foreman, you know, telling you that you should be, you know, putting 15 packages on the conveyor belt per minute instead of 10, like where we agreed that you would have to do, you know, I mean, that's what a union and especially a super aggressive union, a union that views itself as an adversary to management can, uh, that's the difference that a union can make. And John's point also is one of the things that I do try to emphasize in my book so that it's not a, like, even though the FE ceased to exist in 1955, it's not like this uh, terrible, tragic story because I do talk about how this legacy of activism ha carries through even once the UAW um, takes over these farm equipment, former FE plants, how the workers there still, you know, maintain that tradition of militancy and in, in 1979, 1980, the um, harvester workers, then part of the UAW, go on one of the longest strikes in UAW history. And that's to preserve, as John said, and this seems really abstract and weird to many workers now, but that was to preserve the right they had won all the way back in the FE's days to refuse mandatory overtime. You know, and these are workers saying, I don't, you know, I, I am not going to be ordered to come to work when the plant tells me, when the when harvester management tells me to come to work. I want to spend my weekends at home with my kids. Um, and they fought for and preserved that right. Um, so those kinds of imbued um, uh, feelings of what is, um, of what, what rights workers have and what kind of power they have is something that that a militant union can instill in rank and file, they, they'll continue that tradition even when the union itself might change. So that seems like a, a wonderful segue into the next question in the chat. Um, do you see any current unions or rank and file movements that share Effie's approach to collective bargaining, class struggle and membership involvement? How do you think this trend can be further developed today? That's from Mike Slot. Right, and as I mentioned, so the two unions that um, that did survive the the um, the CIO purge, the UE and the ILWU, and the UE in a much diminished um, state versus what it was in the 1940s and 50s, in part due to the CIO raids, but largely because of all of this um, offshoring of electrical um, manufacturing. Um, so it has a much smaller membership than it once did when it had about um, a half a million workers in its in its roster. But those two unions, because again of this radical tradition that they come out of, I think are the you know do maintain this kind of rank and file activism, this sense of their own history, which is another theme that I emphasize through my book, is this this long connection, the long deep grudge that the FE leadership nurtured, this connection to the Haymarket martyrs and to those workers who had fought against the McCormicks for, um, for a decent um, work day. Um, they were constantly making references to that. And that kind of historical consciousness exists to a great degree in the ILWU, which celebrates its own history of struggle all the time and in the UE, I think, um, and, and this sort of rank and file centered um, uh, activism. There's actually a really nice pamphlet that the UE put out recently called Them and Us Unionism. And I'd try to snag it to put in the chat if I could, um, but they just put this out recently and Them and Us Unionism comes from um, their, their uh, leader, Jim Matlas, who, who wrote a book called them and us about, you know, to define sort of, um, you know, obviously the them being being management and the bosses and us being the workers. And so what them and us unionism still means to um, to the um, to the members of the UE or to try to perpetuate that sense among other workers is something they, they put out a really nice pamphlet. Somebody put it in the great. Thank you, Don, for putting it in the in the chat. So I, I suggest you look at that as sort of a union that is still trying to, and actually there's also a, 
I, there was a DSA sponsored discussion of that pamphlet that I participated in with one of the, um, with the UE um, director of organizing. And that is also on YouTube. So maybe Don, if you're out there looking, you can, you can grab that as well. Um, Cause that was really a great discussion we had about how the historic traditions in those two unions um, animated them and how the UE is still trying to, to organize along those lines. Wonderful. Well, I think Don actually also had a, a question. Don, if you don't mind. Sure, thank you. And my question actually, I had this in mind prior to your your, your comments just now, but um, it, re it relates to the, the FEUE relationship because you know, those of us that even studied the history of the left-wing unions a little bit are primarily exposed to UE, and you don't see as much uh, about the other unions like FE. And I wondered, I, I don't know if this is the best question to end on, but I wonder if you could say a little bit more about the the, the somewhat tumultuous relationship that the two had during their um, their uh, autonomous affiliation, uh, as you refer to it. Um, <laughs> Because uh, I'm sure, it, I'm sure it, you know, it brought a lot of good as well. But it's interesting that that despite the fact that they were both communist-led unions, that they um, their relationship was a little stormy. Yeah. So I recently participated in um, this four-part um, discussion group um, sponsored by the DSA Labor Group about my book, and it was kind of you know it was a it was a wonderful thing, and and it's I don't think it's online yet, but it will be at some point. But the reason I'm bringing this up is because the fine, and I used to post at the beginning on a little poll questions that were kind of amusing. And I think the, the last one I, I posted for the last discussion um, was something like, what did you find most surprising in this, you know, that you learned that you didn't know or something. And one of the answers was that the FE and UE leadership, despite their similar, similar ideologies, didn't really get along very well. And I was really surprised that most people chose that answer as their, as when I, and I said to you, people, you're in DSA, you're in a socialist organization. Are you out there telling me that you get along really well with everyone you, you know in your, <laughs> in your, in either this organization or other organizations? So, um, so yes, the fact that obviously that this union, the farm equipment workers leadership had a left-wing ideology and they shared for the most part that ideology with the UE didn't necessarily mean that they all got along swimmingly. The, the um, affiliation between the FE and the UE came about in 1949 after right on the right on the cusp of these expulsions and that the FE was a small union and there was there was a recognition that they would have a great deal of time surviving up against this the UAW's intent to overwhelm them on their own. So this is why they affiliate with a much larger um, UE. But it's also a union that had been used to kind of doing things their own way and a leadership that was very tightly knit and um, very well connected, but didn't like suddenly being thrown into this much larger organization where they had, you know, like anyone, <laughs> where suddenly you have new people that you have to answer to. And this much bigger union, which is also beset by the same kind of problems. And from their perspective, from the UE leadership's perspective, kind of probably didn't want to always hear from the FE telling them, hey, we need more money. We need more organizers, you know, while probably the UE leaders are saying, well, we have this local, um, you know, that's that's as big as, you know, half of the plants you represent. I mean, I remember David Montgomery, who was also Jim Barrett out there, his um, uh, his advisor, the dean of labor historians, um, and David had been a UE organizer, machinist, and member. And when I first met David, um, when I went to graduate school to study with him, um, he did remind me that there were entire locals in the UE that were probably bigger than the entire FE membership. So, you know, just to sort of put things in perspective. You know, so, so, so we would wish those of us on the left that ideological perspective would make for always harmonious, um, concerted solidarity, but it doesn't always. And those kind of personal um, difficulties contributed, but they obviously weren't the essential issue that um, that moved um, the FE to 
end up moving into the UAW. Mostly it was just a question of survival and how they were going to manage to preserve what they had fought for. But certainly, yeah, there's a lot of, I enjoyed in my book, not just telling this, this the story that I told today, which is the story of ideologies and contracts. And, you know, there's also a lot in the book to encourage you to read it that is just personal stories about people um, and their, the ways in which they got along or didn't get along. And there's stories from the management side and the worker side, and there are all kinds of um, vignettes and anecdotes of people, especially, well, I would say throughout, but, but in the 1952 struggle, there are like, you know, mob lawyers who come into it and jazz musicians. And, you know, there are people throughout that just um, are part of this story. And so it is kind of amazing that this tiny obscure union that hardly anyone has ever heard of, in fact, touched so many important parts of American labor history. And um, so that's, um, I think that's true. And I think that's why people have kind of enjoyed reading it. So. Yes, well, we have uh, about three minutes if somebody wants to ask one last quick question or uh, have a comment they'd like to share. So I'll give folks just a, a moment. Um, but otherwise, we very much hope that you will return tomorrow. Um, oh, fantastic. Okay, John. Have we got another question? Oh, John, you're you're muted. Yes, I'm sorry. When the Ruthers drove out the left in the name of anti-Stalinism and anti-authoritarianism and imposed the administration caucus on the UAW, which then ran it as a one-party union until most recently when 12 of them were thrown in jail for corruption, the leadership of the international, it shows you what the end product of what they did was. When they eliminated opposition, when they in eliminated independent voices, militants, and controlled the union from the top down, we finally ended up with a union as corrupt as the Teamsters. Yeah, sadly, that's true. And I do think that, yeah, Ruther's, you know, Obviously, on many levels, I mean, one of the quotes that I have in the book from from someone is, you know, said that from another labor leader said that Ruther, Walter Ruther deserves a lot of credit and Ruther saw that he got it, you know, so he was an incredibly talented, driven labor leader, but he was also driven to control his own union. And it's true that, it's, that, it, that in addition to everything else he accomplished, the legacy of Rutherism is also seen in uh, the disintegration of the UAW from within because there was this one, you know, loyalty to the UAW came to mean loyalty to Walter Ruther. And that was bad enough when he was alive. And once, once he, he died, then the uh, disintegration within the union has had profound effects for the labor movement well beyond just um, what was true for auto workers. So. Um, so yeah, a, a, um, a lesson in the importance of maintaining rank and file democracy um, can certainly be seen by looking at what happened to the UAW and that you know trading, trading money for control, whether you're talking about on the shop floor or in your own union is not always the best um, deal. Um, and someone posted about the, the, the UAW reform effort, which is ongoing and um, we'll have to see what happens with that, but yeah, we need dynamic and um, class conscious unionism in order to really spark this new labor movement that we we need so desperately. And 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 you know, things are the ground is kind of shifting beneath us. So we hope that that's what we'll be seeing. But it's got to come always, you know, from the from the bottom up, from the workers. Um, so we we hope to be seeing that. But anyway, I do want to before I before we have to end this, I just wanna thank everybody who was here and um, really hope that you'll tune in tomorrow for this really remarkable story of um, what happened with the FE in Louisville. And as I said, Beverly, I'm gonna put you on the spot and have you talk a little bit about your amazing father and family and um, uh, the legacy of that history, the FE's history down in Louisville. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much. And I, I want to apologize to David Simmons, who um, I think you had your hand raised. Oh, no. and I'm sorry. Soon enough. Um, but so I, I don't know if David, you want to impart some some uh, final words or if you could come back tomorrow and oh, OK, your hand is back up. Fabulous. Let's see, I'm not hearing anything from David, so. Um, the, uh, the previous uh, speaker addressed the issue of the corruption at the top of the UAW. The UAW. That was my, uh, my question. And so uh, okay. it was covered. So we covered it. Okay, very good. You probably have a union background, so. That All right, well, I assume everybody probably has to hop off and go have lunch or go back to work or whatever whatever one has to do in pandemic world these days. But um, again, I appreciate everyone being here. Stay safe and healthy. And hopefully I will see you all tomorrow and look forward to your conversation then. Thank you so much, Tony. See you tomorrow. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Stay well.